Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Divine. This is episode 357 of the Divine Intervention Podcasts. And this podcast is going to be on a high yield topic that many people find to be very challenging for the USMLE exams. You know, step one, step two, CK, step three. And I'm going to call this the Clutch Disorders of Sexual Differentiation Podcast. The Clutch Disorders of Sexual Differentiation Podcast. Before I roll right into things, um, I have a list of three courses that are coming up over the next few weeks. Um, the first one is more immediate. It's a review for Step 2 CK, Step 3. And you know, you also, if you're taking Comlex Level 2 and 3, basically the course uh, is going to start off with a test taking strategies course that will be taking place on the 27th of this month, the 27th of December. It's going to be from 12 to 2.30 uh, Mountain Standard Time. Um, again, I got a lot of emails from people saying, oh, you know, I have my USMLE Step 2, Step 3 exam towards the end of this month, early next month. So I decided to hold essentially an emergency test taking strategies course. So it'll be on the 27th of December from noon to 2.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And then I'm having like a compressed uh, 10 hour review for Step 2 CK and Step 3 on the 29th of this month, December from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Mountain Time. It's a one day course. So you get everything in a day. Uh, that's going to be on the 29th of December. And then next month in the month of January, I have the 24-hour course with the test taking strategies course. The 24-hour course will be on the 24th of January, 2022. And then the, I mean, the MBA test taking strategies course will be on the 24th of uh, January, 2022 from, you know, 2 to 4.30 p.m. Mountain Time. And then the 24-hour MBME review course, you know, for step two, step three will be from the 25th to the 28th uh, from 7 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mountain Time each day. Again, we'll be going over surgery, pediatrics, internal medicine, ob psychiatry, neurology, ethics, biostatistics, healthcare systems, professionalism, communications, and we'll also be discussing multi-system processes and disorders. And then finally, the next course is then uh, what I call a foundations course. It's a 25-hour course. If you're a person, because the thing is many people, they struggle on the USMLE exams because they just have the wrong foundation. The thing is, if you're building a house and you have the wrong foundation, uh, that house will collapse when it's subjected to any sort of pressure. So if you want to build a solid foundation in just understanding things, understanding physiology and pathophysiology, the 25-hour course is precisely what you need. Um, it's going to be taking place from the 31st of January, 2022, all the way to the 4th of February, 2022. So if you're interested, and it's not just for people taking step one, you know, people taking step one, yes, you know, they need that deep physiology and pathophysiology understanding, you know, integrated with multiple disciplines. But this will also be a class for people that are taking step two or step three that have a very weak foundation from step one. So if you perform poorly on step one, you're going to find the course to be extremely helpful. So let's just go ahead and get right into it, right? So the thing is, if you want to understand the disorders of sexual differentiation, the very first thing you need to get down pat is just how differentiation of sexes work in the first place, right? The thing is, the default program for most human beings is actually to just be female. But if you have certain activity in place, then you don't have to be female, you can be male. Right. So how exactly does this work? Well, the thing is, we all know that men have a Y chromosome. Right. That's very important. Right. So as a man, that Y chromosome has an SRY region, the sex determining region on the Y chromosome. OK, well, since it's a region on a chromosome, that means it must be a gene that codes for something. So what does he code for? What protein does he code for? What gene product does he code for? Well, the thing he codes for right, is what we call the testis determining factor. And we know that that testis determining factor, literally look at the name, testis determining factor. It's a factor that makes your undifferentiated gonad become a testis, right? And the thing is, once you become a testis, there are many types of cells in the testes, but the two that I'm going to concern myself with today are the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cells. So remember those Sertoli cells, what do they do? They make Mollerian inhibiting factor. So basically, the Mollerian inhibiting factor will inhibit everything that is derived from the Mollerian duct. So things like your fallopian tubes, your uterus, the upper portion of your vagina. 
Those things come from your malarian duct. Remember, sometimes we call it the paramesonephric duct. Those things, their development is inhibited by the malarian inhibiting factor. Sometimes they call it MIS or anti-malarian hormone, AMH, that comes from the Sertoli cells. Now, it is extremely high yield to remember that in men, malarian inhibiting factor kills everything that comes from the malarian duct. But the thing is, the malarian duct is not completely killed off in men, right? And the malarian duct actually becomes something that we call the appendix testes, right? So our friends at the MBME exam, at, at the MBME, they can give you a question about like a young boy comes in, has acute onset testicular pain, right? And then in the question, they will see something about bluish discoloration of the testicle, right? And of course, the MBME is in their great wisdom. They will put an answer that says, ooh, testicular torsion, testicular torsion. And then they'll put an answer choice that says torsion of the appendix testes. The thing is, whenever you see any blue anything on a man's testicle and he has acute onset testicular pain, they've pretty much told you of something we call the blue dot sign, right? The blue dot sign is pathognomonic for torsion of the appendix testes. For that, obviously, is supportive care. You're not going to be doing any kind of uh, detorsing the testicle and orchiopexy or whatever. You're not going to be doing any of those things, right? So that's just, again, a nice integration there for you, for your exams. Now, Right? So we've talked about the Sertoli cells makes malaria an inhibiting factor. Right, Again, remember, the malaria duct does not give rise to the ovaries. That's a classic mistake that many medicals, trust me, I've seen this, right? I've tutored thousands of people in my lifetime. I've seen many medical students make this mistake. The ovaries do not come from the malaria duct. Right, Your ovaries are not from the malaria duct. Now, so we said the testes, you know, has Sertoli cells makes malaria an inhibiting factor. Now, another thing that's made by your test, another cell type that we find in the testes are the Leydig cells, right? Now, the Leydig cells, they produce testosterone, right? Your Leydig cells produce testosterone. So, what does testosterone do? Well, this testosterone makes your Wolfian duct, right? Sometimes they call it the mesonephric duct, but your Wolfian duct, it makes it form internal male genital structures, right? So, like, for example, things like your epididymis, your vas deferens, your seminal vesicles, right? All those things, for them, for your Wolfian ducts to differentiate down that pathway, it needs testosterone to be doing its job. That's very important to know. Now, in terms of your external genitalia, a derivative of testosterone helps with that purpose, right? So what's that der derivative of testosterone? That derivative of testosterone is going to be DHT, dihydrotestosterone, right? Dihydrotestosterone is made by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, that converts that testosterone to DHT. And then that DHT makes your external genitalia on the outside that are default female become default male. What do I mean by that, right? So say, for example, in women, we know the labia, right? If you've studied any kind of female anatomy, we all know what the labia is. Well, the thing is, the labia, believe it or not, is what ultimately forms the scrotum in men. Basically, under the action of dihydrotestosterone, that labia then fuses. It fuses and becomes the scrotum, right? Or we look at the clitoris in a woman. The clitoris in a woman, believe it or not, is what forms the penis in men. Essentially, that clitoris elongates and becomes the penis in men under the action of DHT. In fact, if you look at the fetus before DHT is made in utero, right? That's why many times you cannot tell the sex of the fetus until a certain number of weeks of gestation. Because the thing is, prior to that, believe it or not, the fetus, the external genitalia looks female. But after your body, after your testes, under the action of 5 alpha reductase, starts making DHT, then you'll notice that, hmm, this thing that was labia before looks a lot like a scrotum. Hmm, this thing that was clitoris before looks a lot like a penis, right? So the thing is, DHT is necessary for you to be virilized. So for the default external female genitalia, if you're a guy, you're 46XY, for that thing to look male, you need DHT to help you, at least up until a certain point, right? So that's very important to know for purposes of, of exams. And again, remember, 5-alpha reductase, right? Again, I said it converts testosterone to DHT. The thing is, we can use, because DHT, one of the things it does actually is to make your prostate grow. And the thing is, if you're an old guy, you don't really want your prostate growing because if it grows, it can, uh, it can basically cause an extrinsic or external compression of your urethra, right? Your prost prostatic urethra. If you compress the prostatic urethra, you're going to have a lot of problems like, I don't know, like BPH, right? It's going to be that 70-something-year-old or whatever old guy 
on the exam that he's having like urinary dribbling. Sometimes he can present with like lower abdominal pain. Well, I mean, acutely, obviously, you're going to give an alpha-1 blocker, right? Though so you can do like a self-catheterization. But what you can do long-term for those men is to give them a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, right? So something like finasteride or dutasteride, right? Those things will, over time, over about a six-month period, cause massive shrinkage of the prostate. If the prostate shrinks, then the prostatic urethra will open up and that guy will not be having urinary dribbling anymore, right? So again, you see the way our friends at the MBMEs, they love to integrate things on, on exams. Again, this is precisely what I love to do during my review courses. Now, so those are the big things with the way a uh, person's sex develops, right? So that's one big thing I think I want to hit on today. Now, the second big thing I want to hit on today, because these disorders of sexual differentiation, many people really struggle with them. But to be honest with you, again, it's so easy if the understanding is there. Simple as that. If the understanding is there, it becomes extremely easy for you, right? So let me give you a rule. I call it the breasts and pubic hair rule, okay? Now, let me tell you this. If a woman or if a person has the right kinds of breasts, that tells you that estrogen is okay. Estrogen is not a problem for them. If you have good breasts, estrogen is working just fine, right? Now, if you have good axillary and pubic hair, then that means that your testosterone is working just fine. Again, you may say, why is Divine introducing these rules? I promise you, you'll see as we go through the rest of this podcast, uh, I guess video, since I'm putting this on YouTube, you'll see how helpful this can be for analyzing these uh, disorders of sexual differentiation problems. I'm going to start calling them DSD problems for sure. So that's the second thing I want to establish today. Now, the third thing I want to establish today is this whole business of DSD. So many of us, we see these terms on exams because again, the MBME is right. Like I've said this many times in my podcast that they love doing these things where they put uh, derivative answers to questions, right? Because again, what's the point of putting, because they, let, let me put it this way. The MBME recognizes that we live in an Anki generation. So what do you do for an Anki generation? Don't put those buzzwords that they've memorized. Just put descriptors of those buzzwords. For example, right? A, a very easy thing to do is to call, uh, is to put an answer choice. Like you've seen me say this in many different podcasts. Like, oh, this person has IgA nephropathy, IgA nephropathy, right? Anyone that has looked at any Anki deck for medical students probably knows what IgA nephropathy is. But how can you make it harder? Well, the way you can make it harder is you can just say, oh, synpharyngitic nephropathy. You, you put synpharyngitic? The person like, what? But again, if you really think about it, what, what in the world does that term mean? It just means that you're having a nephropathy synonymously at around the same time as when you have the pharyngeal infection, right? So that's what the MBMEs love to do these days, right? Oh, instead of putting Kawasaki's disease, they put mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome. Again, just all, most times these derivative answers are just answers you will get right if you understand the pathophysiology behind that specific disease, so the third thing I want to establish today is let me explain to you when you use, there are some DSD terminologies they use on exams, right? So like, for example, you may see this term 46XXDSD, 46XXDSD, or sometimes they can say 46XX, pseudo-hermaphrodite. Let me tell you this. Whenever they give you these terms like 46XXDSD, it means that the person genotypically is female. The person is 46XX, has the genotype of a female, but the person has the phenotype of a guy, right? So the thing is, there are many types of 46XX DSDs. For example, androgen insensitivity syndrome, which I'll talk about in a bit, is an example of a 46XX DSD, right? Or if you see, for example, a woman that has aromatase deficiency, right? Because remember, aromatase is an enzyme that converts androgen to estrogens. Right? So the thing is, if you lack aromatase and you can convert androgens to estrogens, you'll be a woman, you'll be 46XX, but you may look male on the outside. Right? That's another example of a 46XX DSD. Right? So the term 46XX DSD, one-to-one -one is the same thing as a 46XX pseudohermaphrodite. Right? So the XX or XY or whatever they give you in the actual question, right? Oh, whoops, sorry, I made a mistake there, right? Androgen insensitivity syndrome is actually a 46XY DSD, right? So the person is a guy genotypically, but is a woman 
phenotypically, right? That's a 46XY DSD, right? 46XXDSD will be something, again, like I said, like aromatase deficiency. Or if a woman has like 21 hydroxylase deficiency, which is making a ton of testosterone, a ton of, not testosterone, a ton of androgen, right? Because she lacks 21 hydroxylase or she has made autoantibodies against 21 hydroxylase, right? Then the person may be 46XX, but it may have all these male features. Why do they have these male features? Because again, they are making a ton of androgen, right? So 21 hydroxylase deficiency, aromatase deficiency, those would be examples of 46XX DSDs. Those people are XX, they are females genotypically, but they are males phenotypically. But a 46XY DSD will be something like androgen insensitivity syndrome. You're literally male on the inside. You're genotypically male. You're 46XY. But phenotypically, you look female, right? So that'll be a 46XY DSD or a 46XY pseudo-hermaphrodite. Again, if you understand these naming conventions, when you start putting these different name permutations on your exam, you don't get uh, spooked when you see something like that. So now, let's go into some of these actual disorders, right? So the first one, what if they give you a question about a newborn, right? They tell you that, oh, this newborn has ambiguous genitalia. And you notice that, oh, this newborn has hyponatremia, has hyperkalemia, has a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. If you see this, what do you want to think about well, I would really hope you're saying, oh, divine, this child has 21 hydroxylase deficiency, right? Remember, 21 hydroxylase deficiency is the most common cause of ambiguous genitalia on MBM exams, right? Because essentially, the thing that happens is you have a deficiency of 21 hydroxylase. And when you have a deficiency of that enzyme, you're not going to be making cortisol. You're not going to be making aldosterone. The only thing you're going to be making in great quantity are androgens like DHEAS, for example. Right. So, for example, in a in a woman, right, when she's seen all that DHAS, 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 she's gonna have ambiguous genitalia, because the genitalia is just receiving all these mixed signals. It's like, ah, oh, I'm female, but why am I getting all these androgen and all these problems, right? So you're gonna see ambiguous genitalia, right? So you may be like, oh, divine, why do they have these uh, strange uh, electrolyte abnormalities? Well, think about it. It's because they have an aldosterone deficiency. What exactly does aldosterone do for human beings? Well, aldosterone does a few things. It makes you reabsorb sodium in your nephron, right? It makes you urinate potassium in your nephron. And it also makes you urinate hydrogen ions in your nephron, right? So if for whatever bizarre reason you have an aldosterone deficiency, well, guess what? You're going to have the reverse of all those problems. Instead of being able to retain sodium, you'll get rid of it. So you have hyponatremia. Instead of being able to urinate potassium, you'll hang on to it you will have hyperkalemia. Instead of urinating hydrogen ions, you will hang, hang on to it, you have a metabolic acidosis. More specifically, you have a type 4 RTA. Remember, a type 4 RTA is an example of a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, right? So when you have the type 4 RTA, remember, type 4 RTAs are RTAs you get from a low aldosterone state. You get type 4 RTAs because you have a low aldosterone state. So if you have a low aldosterone state, you're going to get a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So that's why they have those findings. Now, some of you may be like, oh, divine. Why is it that some newborns get this problem? But then some people wait till their teenage years before they get this problem. Let me tell you this. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia does not only arise because you just have like a genetic deficiency of 21 hydroxylase. Believe it or not, some people get congenital adrenal hyperplasia because they make autoantibodies against 21 hydroxylase right, is essentially almost like a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. You make autoantibodies against 21 hydroxylase, you knock it out of circulation, then you're not going to be making cortisol, and you're not going to be making aldosterone anymore, right? So I've talked about the female presentation. Can this present in males? Absolutely. Men can absolutely positively get 21 hydroxylase deficiency on MBM exams. It's just in the case of a guy, it would not be called a 46XX DSD. In the case of a guy, it will actually be a cause of precocious puberty. Because if you're a man and you're seeing all these androgens, you're going to be like, quote, quote unquote, like a supercharged male. And if you're a supercharged male, right, you're going to have precocious puberty. So if you see a, a, a child that, you know, has, uh, especially a male child, that's when one hydroxylase deficiency, right, he will have precocious puberty. He will actually have a kind of precocious puberty we call peripheral precocious puberty. 
right? Because again, it's not a problem in the brain. It's a problem outside the brain. This will be a peripheral cause of precocious puberty. Okay, let me go to my next uh, thing. So what if they give you a question, right? right? About a 21-year-old female. They tell you that she has never had menses before. She's never had a period. And then they tell you that her vagina ends in a blind pouch. And they tell you that she has Tanner stage one, pubic and axillary hair. Okay, look at what I just said. Tanner stage one, pubic and axillary hair. Just knowing that alone tells you, oh, there is something wrong with the androgens of this patient, right? If you're 21, you should not be at Tanner stage one in terms of pubic or axillary hair. So that tells you your androgens don't work. So what does that mean? It means this person has androgen insensitivity syndrome, right? Again, remember, these people are male genetic, uh, genetically, right? They are 46XY, but on the outside, they are females. So this is an example of a 46XY DSD, 46XY DSD. So what's the pathophysiology behind this? Well, the thing is, these people are gene genetically guys. They have testes. They make testosterone, but... The problem is that the testosterone receptor just does not work. So you can have all the testosterone you want, but testosterone receptor doesn't work. If it doesn't work, then you're going to have a lot of problems. Again, all these problems are very predictable if you're going by principle, if you're going by understanding, instead of just brute force memorization. Because think about it. If your testosterone doesn't work, then what do you think is going to happen to the Wolfian duct? <laughs> the Wolfian duct is not going to develop, right? So all those things like... Uh, seminiferous tubules, epididymis, vas deferens, blah, 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 blah. Those things are not going to develop well, right? So the Wolfian duct derivatives are going to be gone, okay? Well, these people have Sertoli cells that make molarin inhibiting factor, and the molarin inhibiting factor works just fine. So guess what? Everything from the molarian duct, everything from that thing we call paramesonephric duct, doesn't develop. Like what? The fallopian tubes, the uterus, the upper vagina does not develop. So internal male reproductive structures, these people don't have. Internal female reproductive structures, these people don't have. And again, if your testosterone is not working well, guess what? You're not going to be making DHT. If you do not make DHT, then your external genitalia will stay by the default female mode. It won't virilize and become like a scrotum or become like a penis. No, it will stay. Right? It will be like a labia, you'll, you'll see labia, you'll see clitoris, right? And you, because remember, the, the lower vagina, the lower two thirds of the vagina, well, let me, because it kind of, you see people say some of these two thirds, one thirds. Let me just say this the lower vagina comes from the urogenital sinus, it doesn't come from the Mullerian duct, right? So that's that blind vaginal pouch that you're seeing in these people, right? So again, because the androgen doesn't work, their pubic and axillary hair will not be good. Again, this is an example of a 46XY disorder of sexual differentiation. And one thing you want to keep at the back of your mind for purposes of USMLE exams is that these men, you actually need to resect their testes. If not, they have a very high risk of developing a testicular mass called a gonadoblastoma, right? They can develop gonadoblastomas on MBME exams. Okay, now, what if they give you a question about, uh, you know, like a 12-year-old boy? A 12-year-old female, you know, they tell you that she has like a fused labia, uh, she has a nondescript clitoris, um, they tell you that, you know, she had very girl-like features for the first few years of life, but that over the last like 12 months, it's almost like she's been undergoing like a metamorphosis of a sort, it's almost like she's transforming from being female to male. And they tell you that, oh, they perform an ultrasound and they see normal uh, male internal genital structures. If you see this, then I want you to think of a person having 5-alpha reductase deficiency. I want you to think of 5-alpha reductase deficiency. So this is one of those DSDs that is very hard for people to pick up on exams. Now, let me tell you what the hallmark will be. The hallmark will be a person, because you may say, oh, wouldn't they have like a straight up, you know, completely clean, fine, okay, labia and clitoris? No, they won't. They won't. Let me tell you what will happen. The labia and clitoris in these women will be abnormal. They, many times they're going to be fused or they're going to be ambiguous on MBMA exams. And then many times in the question, they'll be kind enough to say, oh, they perform an ultrasound and they see normal internal male genital structures, right? And you'll also notice this person when they hit puberty, 
they almost undergo this thing I call like metamorphosis. This is something you probably learned, uh, you know, maybe back in the day in, I don't know, I learned this back in the day like in Nigeria as a very little kid. You know, how certain animals just change from one thing to the other over a few hours or a few days, right? This is almost like a human metamorphosis. You're like, Man, this person was like a woman, like, looked very female, like, a year ago. But now this person's voice is now deep and all those things. If you see that, think of 5 alpha reductase deficiency. So what's the pathophysiology? Well, the name of the disease tells you exactly what happens. You have a deficiency of 5 alpha reductase. If you have a deficiency of 5 alpha reductase, the thing that's going to happen is you're not going to convert testosterone to DHT. Well, you have testosterone. So you're going to, your internal male genital structures are going to be A-OK. -okay because those depend on testosterone to work right. Again, things like your seminiferous tubules, epididymis, vas deferens, and things of that nature. But your external genitalia is going to stay female or stay close to female, right? That's why these people tend to have ambiguous genitalia. But the thing is, when you hit puberty, right? Puberty is like the time of raging hormones. Those men are going to start making tons and tons and tons of testosterone. That testosterone that is produced in high quantity is going to force virilization. And then those people over time will start looking like males, right? In fact, there are certain cultures, I think they call it like Guevedoches, that have this problem, right? But again, if you understand all these things I just mentioned, I don't see why you should not be able to get a 5 alpha reductase deficiency question right on your exam. Okay, now, what if they give you a question about a 21-year-old female? They tell you that, oh, she has, you know, she has never had menses. And they tell you that, you know, her vagina ends in a blind pouch. So you're like, huh, vagina ends in a blind pouch. But then they tell you that, hmm, the axillary and pubic hair are like Tanner stage four, Tanner stage five. If you see this, I would really hope you're not seeing androgen insensitivity syndrome, right? Because they will give you that blind, again, the MDM is they're not stupid. They will give you the blind vaginal pouch. So they will know some people will be like, oh, this must be AIS. And of course, they will put AIS as an answer right? But they will also put Mullerian agenesis as an answer. Which answer should you pick? I would hope you're picking the answer that says Mullerian agenesis. Remember, Mullerian agenesis is also called MRKH syndrome. I believe it's called like Meyer Rokitansky Kusterhauser syndrome. I think that's spelled as Meyer, M-A-Y-E-R, and then a hyphen, uh, then Rokitansky, R-O-K-I, Rokitansky, T-A-N-S-K-Y. Kuster is K-U-S-T-E-R, Hauser, I believe, is H-A-U-S-E-R. So Meyer, Rokitansky, Kusterhauser syndrome. So essentially, the thing that happens with that is these people, their Mullerian duct, for whatever bizarre reason, just does not form. Well, if it doesn't form, then all the derivatives of the Mullerian duct are not going to form. Like what? Well, like your fallopian tubes, which we call the oviducts on some exams, right? Like your fallopian tubes, your uterus, your upper vagina does not form properly. But your lower vagina is just fine. So you'd be like, okay, divine. Why do these people have like normal pubic and axillary hair? Well, think about it. They have ovaries. Remember, the ovaries are not derived from the Mullerian duct. I'll say that again. Your ovaries are not derived from the Mullerian duct. So those ovaries will make androgens, will make your DHEAS and everything. But then under the action of aromatase, you're going to make estrogens from those androgens. Right? So they have andro they have a source of androgens, they have a source of estrogens. So their breasts are gonna be great, their axillary and pubic hair is gonna be fine as well. Why? Because again, those things are coming from ovaries that are there. Those things are coming from ovaries that are there, right? So that's the long and short of Mullerian agenesis, right? That's pretty much that's pretty much it. Again, many of these things you notice that they are just extremely easy if the pathophysiology, if the right foundation is there. Okay. And we'll be wrapping this up soon because I don't want this to go on for too long, right? Now, again, one thing that is pretty close that, you know, I talked about at the beginning as an example of a 46XXDSD is aromatase deficiency, right? Again, remember aromatase, what does it do? Aromatase's job is to convert androgens to estrogen. So if a woman has an aromatase deficiency, she doesn't have an enzyme that will help her make estrogens. So she'll, she'll be a woman, right? But she'll have a lot of androgen, right? So the thing, unfortunately, in these women is that you'll notice that they have male features. They have like a deepening of their voice. They have like male pattern hair growth. 
they have a lot of acne, things like that. And here's one very good thing that may tell you that you're dealing with aromatase deficiency on your MBM exams. Here's what they will tell you, right? They will tell you that, oh, the person gets pregnant. And during the person's pregnancy, the person's uh, symptoms or signs of hyperandrogenism seem to get worse. Well, why did that happen? The thing is the fetus is making a ton of androgen, crossing the placenta and then causing problems for mom, right? That's many times a pretty classic hallmark for aromatase deficiency. Aromatase deficiency, again, is an example of a 46XX DSD. This person literally looks, is female genetically, but on the outside may look male. Many times, because that because some people may be like, oh, divine, how do I know this aromatase deficiency? The thing is, if people will not look fully male, but they will have signs of hyperandrogenism. In fact, the MDM is they will try to write it as being almost like a PCOS question, right? They're going to have signs and symptoms of hyperandrogenism, but on the outside, they will not look fully, fully male. Again, that's something high yield to know for exams. And remember, aromatase is a pretty high yield enzyme to know for many reasons, right? Like, for example, if a woman needs breast cancer chemoprophylaxis and she's over the age of 50, are you going to be using tamoxifen on exams? I hope your answer to that is no, right? Don't use tamoxifen. Because again, the risk of endometrial cancer, remember tamoxifen is an estrogen receptor agonist in the uterus. So it increases a woman's risk of endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. So when a woman goes past the age of 50 on MDM exams and she needs breast cancer chemoprophylaxis, you're going to be using an aromatase inhibitor, something like anastrozole or letrozole or exemestine on exams, right? Now, remember, we also use aromatase inhibitors in women that uh, have PCOS that are trying to get pregnant, right? The classic poster child for this on MBM exams is letrozole. Well, why does letrozole help? Well, think about it. If you inhibit aromatase, you're not going to be making estrogen anymore. If you don't make estrogen, well, guess what? There's not going to be any negative feedback at the level of the hypothalamus. So you're going to be making more GNRH. You're going to make more FSH and LH. You're going to stimulate those follicles and you're going to get pregnant, right? Although remember, for that purpose, you can also use clomiphene. Uh, clomiphene is actually a serum, right? Clomiphene, believe it or not, it kind of works like tamoxifen. Essentially, what clomiphene does is it, it's a partial estrogen receptor agonist in the central nervous system, right? Remember, whenever something is a partial agonist, it's essentially an antagonist. So it's essentially, essentially antagonizing estrogen activity at the level of the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. So that's going to make you make more gonadotropins and you're going to get pregnant. Right? So again, those are all uses of aromatase inhibitors. You can also use them for malignancy, believe it or not, on MBM exams, especially malignancies that are driven by estrogen, right? Again, certain breast malignancies are treated with, uh, with aromatase inhibitors, again, like anastrozole, letrozole, you know, exemestine, things like that. Okay, now let's go to another question. What if they give you a question about a uh, 25-year-old female? They tell you that, oh, she comes to the emergency room with, you know, a very bad chest pain going on for the last 30 minutes. And they tell you that, you know, she has shortness of breath. She has a left-sided pleural effusion, right? If you see something like that, and they tell you that this female is like four foot, five inches tall, that tells you all you need to know. This lady has Turner syndrome, right? This lady literally has Turner syndrome, right? So remember, Turner syndrome, again, this is not necessarily a disorder of sexual di uh, differentiation, but I just figured I'll throw these, some of these reproductive disorders in for you as a bonus at the end of this podcast, right? So remember, in Turner syndrome, there are many high yield classic findings you need to know for your test. I mean, you may be like, wow, divine, what, why does this person have chest pain? Well, let me tell you this. People that have Turner syndrome, they're actually predisposed to having aortic dissection on MBME exams, right? Because again, these people tend to have many aortic abnormalities. Yes, you know, they can have bicuspid aortic valve, but they're also predisposed to having aortic dissection, which this female has. Right? So remember, these people, they can get the murmur of aortic stenosis very early in life, right? Usually around like their 40s or like 50s. Most times when people have aortic stenosis, aortic stenosis is supposed to be a senior citizen's disease. It's supposed to be a problem you find in people that over the age of 60, over the age of 70, right? When you see it in a person that is in their early 50s, in their 40s, those people have bicuspid aortic valve on an exam. So why do they get the aortic stenosis early? Well, think about it. Your aortic valve is supposed to have three cusps, right? In a bicuspid valve, your aortic valve has two cusps. Well, do you see a problem with that? If two people are <laughs> handling the job of three, something is going to have to give, right? So those things wear out on an accelerated basis compared to a normal three-cusped aortic valve, 
right? So that's why bicuspid aortic valve can cause aortic stenosis. Now, what are some other problems we find in turners? Well, remember these people, they can give you that these people have like recurrent UTIs or they have hydronephrosis or they have renal failure. Well, why is that? Again, that's gonna be from horseshoe kidney, right? Again, the inferior poles of the kidneys are fused and they are stuck under one of the mesenteric arteries, right? And then remember, people that have Turner syndrome, right? They have this web neck, right? You see many times they call it a cystic hygroma. Again, our friends at the MBMEs, they're not stupid. They're not. They know that any person that has the job description, medical student has memorized that, oh, you know, people that have Turner syndrome, they have a cystic hygroma on the neck. Da, 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 da. Yeah, they know. Ha, they know. Right? So instead of putting cystic hygroma as an answer, what is the smart thing our friends at the MBMEs do? They put the term congenital lymphedema. Congenital lymphedema. So what will help you get that quest kind of question right is having the understanding. Because those cystic hygromas arise because you have abnormal development of your lymphatic channels. Simple as that. If you understand the pathophysiology, even if you don't see the classic thing you're used to, cystic hygroma, you will still get the question right on your test. Simple as that, right? And then they can even give you a question about a patient that has Turner syndrome. And they tell you that, oh, this person has low extremity claudication. You know, they walk for like a few blocks and they have to stop because their legs are hurting. And they tell you that, oh, the person has like a radio femoral pulse delay, right? The thing is, the, the artery doesn't matter. It's just going to be a permutation of an upper extremity artery and a lower extremity artery where you feel the pulse in the upper extremities and it takes a long time before you feel the pulse in the lower extremities. That person has coarctation of the aorta. The person literally has coarctation, right? And again, what is coarctation? Well, coarctation is where you have an obstruction, right? It's almost like a compression in the walls of the aorta, right? So you are perfusing your upper extremities well, but you're not perfusing your lower extremities well, right? And many times, if you get a chest x-ray for these people, you're going to see that affectionately described as three signs. Right? You're going to see the three sign because, again, you're forming all these intercostal vessels that are almost forming like a, you know, like another route for blood across the, across the obstructed aorta, right? But again, remember, the arteries are very pulsatile, right? So for each pulsation of the artery, you're literally wearing away your ribs. As you wear away your ribs, you're going to run into troubles, right? That's why you're going to find that rib notching on a chest x-ray. Remember, coarctation of the aorta, you need surgery to treat. There's no drug that can save you from coarctation of the aorta. Okay, now what if they give you a question about a lady that has never had a period, right? Or, you know, they tell you that you have this man and he has like Tanner stage 1 pubic and axillary hair and they tell you that he has a problem with smell. Well, if you see this, I would hope you're saying, oh, divine, this is common syndrome, right? Common syndrome. Remember, in common syndrome, you have problems with cells migrating, right? And the two cells you need to care about are one, your neurons that make gonadotropin releasing hormone and then your neurons that uh, cranial nerve one, your olfactory, your olfactory nerve. So you can't smell, but you also, I mean, literally common syndrome, if you think about it, these people have something that, again, our friends at the MBMEs, instead of putting common syndrome as an answer, what is one smart thing they do? They call it hypogonadotropic hypogonadism on exams. Okay. So you'd be like, define common syndrome, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. What's up with that? Well, let me explain. Let me explain. Hypogonadotropic hypogonadism means that the gonadotropins are low, right? Because think about it. If your GnRH producing neurons don't work, then your GnRH is going to be low. If your GnRH is low, your FSH and LH will be low. If your FSH and LH are low, then your sex steroids like estrogen and testosterone will be low as well, right? That's an example of a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. But on the flip side, if you think about a person that has Turner syndrome, remember Turner's is 45XO. And so since they have only one X chromosome, they have no bar body, right? Turner syndrome, these people have streak ovaries. Their ovaries don't work. They are pretty much non-existent. Well, if you don't have functioning ovaries, you're not going to be making estrogen. So you're going to be hypogonadotropic. But guess what? Your, so your gonads are not working. But because you're not making estrogen, there is no negative feedback at the level of the brain. Right? So you're going to be making a ton of GnRH, a ton of FSH, a ton of LH, but you're not making estrogen. So your gonadotropins are high, but you're hypogonadal. Right? That's an example of amenorrhea secondary to a hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Right? Hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Or you see a person that has athletic amenorrhea. 
right? Where they are not eating enough, so their HPG axis shuts down. There'll be an, an example of, an, of a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, right? And then to wrap up here today, remember, they can give you a question about a man, you know, has low libido, right? Has poorly developed pubic and axillary hair, but they'll tell you he's tall. That's going to be the key word. The person is tall. The person is tall. It's like six foot tall, right? And they tell you he has a family history of breast cancer, right? Or they can tell you that he has gynecomastia, has a micro penis. If you see this, right, this is easy, right? This is Kleinfelter's. Remember, Kleinfelter's is 47XXY, right? Again, remember, as a guy, you're supposed to be 46XY, not 47XXY. So that means this guy has an extra X chromosome. So guess what? He actually does have a bar body. Right? He has a bar body, right? So bar body is spelled B-A-R-R, -R, a bar body, right? Bar body, bar body, right? So you're going to see a tall guy, polydeveloped pubic and axillary hair, micropenis, gynecomastia. The thing is, Kleinfelter is actually a risk factor for male breast cancer, right? Remember, also having a BRCA mutation is one of those risk factors for male breast cancers on MBM exams. So I think I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Um, I think this podcast has gone on for long. Again, as I do at the end of every podcast, I do offer one-on-one tutoring for many exams. Step one, step two CK, step three, uh, preclinical med school exams, 30 year shelf exams. Um, I have another website. It's called divineinterventionlifelessons.com. I try to post like one to two podcasts on that website every, every week um, because many people have emailed me, oh, Divine, I love your life lessons. Um, so... It's actually on Apple Podcasts as well. I have about maybe like 43 episodes or so right now. Um, and basically just Bible-based teaching, very short podcasts that just address a, like common problems that are faced by humanity. And then, again, I offer review courses for the USMLE exams. Again, I've had people, like my MBME test taking strategies course, I've had people, they literally take the course today and by tomorrow they take a practice exam and they bump up like 30, 40 points from their previous practice exams, right? Well, I've seen people, again, Wednesdays are probably one of my happiest days during the week. I get emails from people that have attended my review courses and they've done extremely well on the exams. So again, if you want to register for the review courses, shoot me an email through the website, divineinterventionpodcasts.com, right? Just hit the contact button, shoot me an email, or you can email me directly at divineinterventionpodcasts with an S at the end at gmail.com. And then... I also have these podcasts on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, and on Spotify, right? So at least the most recent 150, if you want everything from episode one all the way to this current episode, then you need to go to the website. Actually, if you subscribe to the website with your WordPress account, whenever I make a new podcast, you'll get an email notification. And then I also help with like ERAS applications and mock interviews and recommendation letters and personal statements. So if that's something you're interested in, just again, shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to point you in the right direction. And then I actually have a very quick life lesson I want to share today. And that life lesson is um, how do you handle power? How do you handle power? The thing is, one of the best ways to know the true content of a person's character is what they're like when they're in a powerful situation of life. The thing is, for some people, power doesn't destroy them. But for some other people, power is what ends up destroying them. So just ask yourself, if you have everything you need, if you have everything at your fingertips, are you still going to be a person of good moral virtue? Right? When you achieve it all, when you get to that pinnacle, because you've seen many people, they get to the pinnacle of life. You know, they get to the very top of their fields and then they commit suicide or whatever, or they start misbehaving. Well, the thing is, those people did not have the character to sustain that success. So one thing I'm going to try to encourage you today as I wrap up this podcast is make sure you're a person of moral virtue. Again, you can be very talented. You can have all the gifts. You can have everything in the world. But power can be very destructive in the hands of a person that does not have the right character. So I'm really encouraging you today. Watch how you handle power. Develop your moral compass. Have that moral compass. Be a principled person. Because that's the thing that will keep you going when you get to the top. The thing is, when you're on a low level in life, people don't really care. But when you get to a high level in life, you're going to be targeted. Right? And when you're targeted, it's those principles that will keep you going well. Right? So I'm really encouraging you today, be a person of principle. Have a good moral standing. For me personally, again, I'm not saying I'm perfect in this way, but I'm doing my very best every day to live by the Bible. The Bible really guides people in the right direction.
right? So again, just don't, don't, uh, your, your talent and whatever can get you to the top, but the thing that will keep you at the top is having just a good moral compass. Don't lose your way. You see some people, they become very wealthy and once they become wealthy, their lives completely fall apart. They start using drugs, doing all these things, right? Just be careful, right? Be careful. To be honest with you, when you are the low situation of, uh, my, my bishop in Nigeria is to say this, that when you are the very low situation of life, I'm basically paraphrasing, uh, pray. But when, you, when your prayers are answered, when you get to a very, very high situation in life, you should pray even more. You should be even more careful because those are like, the time of greatest prosperity is one of the, is, is many times the time where the greatest level of caution is thrown to the wind right? Like, for example, if you think about it, like when the stock market is doing really well and every company is doubling every year, right? People just throw all caution to the wind. They start borrowing money to invest in stocks, right? But when the economy crashes, then you know who has been, when the tide goes out, right? As Warren Buffett will say, when the tide goes out, you know the person that has been swimming naked, right? So I'm encouraging you at every level of life, be a person that follows good moral principles, if you follow those good moral principles, they will keep you regardless of where you are in life. Be it at a low level, be it at a high level, they will literally preserve your soul. So I really hope you found this podcast to be helpful. Thank you for listening to me today. And I really hope that after this, you understand the disorders of sexual differentiation really well. Have a wonderful rest of your day. God bless you. And Merry Christmas in advance. Although I will be making other podcasts before then. God bless you.